inspire them as they go along to, because we know the road or the path instead is not paved in gold. Okay, it might be a little bit rough and rocky. And so we are all here to help them as well as they try to reach their goals. And they also get a one year steer membership in the American Chemical Society. And so each year, we, you know, we really have to plan the, the panel that really looks over each of these packets and tries to decipher or rank each of these students. And from the panelists, when, when the reviewers send in their, their results, it's always to the point where they feel like you're nitpicking because these students are just so awesome. And so for even the students who did not win, we just want to let you know that you are all awesome. Okay? Our first awardee is Miss Jordan herself. Jordan. Unknown. 
introduction. <laughs> I don't know how that works, but anyway, this is what it is. So tonight our speaker is Dr. Al Thompson, um, and he will be talking on the, histor the history of 20th, 20th century African American women scientists. So a little bit of some background about Al. Um, he's got a lot of things here, so I'll give you the generic version that's on the paper, and then I'll just speak a little bit about what I know about it. So, um, he's the chair of the Natural Science and Mathematics Division, and he's a professor in the Department of Chemistry at Spelman. He's been a faculty member at Spelman since 1981. He really looks at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, he earned his BS and MS degrees in chemistry from Texas Southern and a PhD in inorganic chemistry from Howard University. He's a frequent speaker on the preparation and training of minority students in science and, and the contributions of African Americans in the sciences as well. He has hosted high school students in an American Society Project C summer research program and served for 10 years on the ACS National Project C committee and is currently a member of the ACS Committee on Minority Affairs. Al is truly remarkable chemical professional. What he does in the classroom, what he gives to his students is unbelievable. To ensure that women excel in STEM is a gift. You know, sometimes we can, we can teach one subset or a whole subset, but to really be able to motivate African American women in STEM it's a God-given gift. So we thank you tonight, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Al. Patents, 
uh, prior to the early uh, 20th century. But there were many, many contributions. Nobert really was uh, responsible for uh, developing a safer way to refine sugar. This is, he was from New Orleans. This is, uh, the white sugar that we know today, many persons were killed in uh, heating up the vats and, and, and recrystallization of the sugar. I won't go over all of these, but you all know about Elijah McCoy and Louis Latimer who worked alongside, um, what is that man's name? G. E. Edison. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Edison. Uh, but he was a pioneer in, in light in. Now, I'm going to talk about men first because. We're talking about the 19th century, and women had their place in the home. They didn't really have careers, and if they did, they were looked upon in very, very subtle ways. And we'll talk about that later. Uh, I won't talk much about Grand, uh, Grandville Woods with Garrett Morgan, a uh, traffic light person. Now, C.J. Walker's uh, ancestors have said she didn't really invent the straightening cone, but she marketed the straightening cone. And we know she's one of the uh, first self made millionaire of a person of any color. So out of uh, was it Virginia? I think Virginia. And when I was in school, when we had Black History Week, well, it was Negro History Week back then, we always were. George Washington Carver. You know, there are many Carver high schools there in almost every city, but to Washington High Schools. And the peanut, I didn't really learn about uh, the other sweet potato until later, but you know, it was about the peanut. Ernest Just, uh, developmental logic, Just was allowed to actually work at Woods Hole, which is very interesting, but he couldn't bring his wife, but he could come. That doesn't make much sense. <laughs> but uh, you would think because of the biases, you would want to bring his wife. But anyway, um, he's originally from South Carolina. When we look back at the Charleston, Charleston area, we're going to talk about the first PhD in a moment who was originally from South Carolina. And Dr. Lincoln's out there, and quite a bit about this physicist. But, but Ernest just spent most of his career at uh, Howard University. There is a biology building there named for Ernest Just. And uh, I'll talk about uh, some of the problems that one of the female faculty members had with Just, just not being accepted as a equal faculty. We all know about Charles Drew, and his daughter was once the president of what, Southeastern University in Washington. She made it clear that her father didn't die because he was accused of service. He had a car accident in North Carolina, and uh, he died from his injuries. But this, the rumors were that the ambulance would not pick it him up. In fact, Charles Drew was also an athlete, and he was not good enough to get into Howard's medical school, so where did he go? He went to McGill in, in Canada. And we know, his, we know his history now in terms of blood plasma. And again, his Percy Julian, and he was honored with a stamp. Uh, I think it was 1993, and uh, he made it, sentences for cortisol made it available cheaper, more than a tenth less of the cost you know, um, of, of the sentences. I'm using that for products. And you see, I've listed here the, the website, and you can get this on uh, uh, Nova PBS, and I think it's on YouTube now, and that address should work. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about Dale, Daniel Williams. He was a uh, uh, surgeon. James Harris. I met him in uh, Virginia. We met Harris. Harris was part of the National Organization of Black Kids for a few years. He, he never earned a graduate degree. He had an honorary degree. He only had a bachelor's degree. But he worked alongside uh, another researcher out of the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, and they discovered uh, elements of uh, what he was co-worker who discovered 104 and 105, and his co-worker never earned a doctorate. They were too busy working in the laboratory to go back there. Ron can tell you, we know many, many <laughs> don't know scientists who never earned doctorate degrees, most scientists would be necessary. They would be very fabulous for how I'm going to mention some of those things later. Uh, Ed Boucher was born in Charleston, South Carolina. His parents uh, did labor work. His mother, I think, took in Wash and they moved to New Haven, Connecticut. He was, uh, finished his PhD in 1876. 
the first uh, 100 years of this country. Uh, he tutored many of his students, uh, his fellow students in physics. And when I gave this talk some years back, I didn't know what area he worked in, but they told me it was a heavy optics. That was the big thing back then at the Yale College. And as you probably know, most of the PhDs that were earned and those persons who came back to teach at the Ivy League, they earned those degrees in Germany and Europe and the US. So this country was just building its reputation for graduate studies. But he persevered. And uh, I'm going to talk about the second person that got that PhD, because it's pretty soon I'm going to be a little longer. I was going to be a fifth graduate, and Ron and I both spent some of our early years at this when we had black hair. Hey, Yes. Alfred Coffin, uh, the first African American to earn a PhD in zoology at Illinois Western. I'm not sure if they, I know they exist, I don't know if they still have a graduate program, but he was a FISC graduate, you know, and so FISC is going to pop up quite a bit uh, in, 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 in our talk. And we also talked about Sam, St. Elmo Brady. The, the chemistry building at Fisk University is, is the name the Tally Brady Building. Tally was uh, an instructor. <laughs> uh, uh, Caucasian who taught St. Elmo as an undergraduate, and uh, so the building was named for both of them. And at that time, uh, uh, Howard, those are the only two historical black colleges that had chemistry buildings, the only for chemistry, if I'm not mistaken. And, and he spent most of his career at Fisk, and he did his degree at the University of Illinois. In, in, in 1916, so you heard in the video that uh, Percy Junior uh, knew of St. Elmo Brady and, and went to uh, get his degree, which he did. So, uh, this is a picture of Yale College, and it talks about Ever Blue Shape. And in fact, I think every year Yale still has this symposium, the Blue Shape Symposium, I think people would like to speak. Uh, he taught at the Hopkins School. Interestingly, he tutored many of his fellow classmates, but obviously could not get a job teaching. So he ended up at Cheney, which is uh, Cheney University now. It was once in Philadelphia, and then they moved it out to the rural part of Pennsylvania, I think off the U.S. one or whatever. Institute for Color View. What is it? Institute for Color View. Yeah, that's the original name, that's right, Institute for Color View. And I know that he taught at Bishop College, which is no longer exists, so he uh, spent, I believe, most of his years there. Uh, but optics, as I, I was uh, learned, was, 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 was his area. I mentioned Irons, who was born in Memphis, Tennessee. He was the second African American to earn a PhD in physics, and the first in the 20th century. And he's considered uh, a modern physicist. And, and this for a number of years, number of years ran the Infrared Institute, and, and, and persons from industry, colleges all over the year, all over the U.S. And, and other countries came to this to spend a week uh, with the uh, Infrared Institute. He did his PhD at the University of Michigan, and obviously his BS uh, at uh, uh, at this university. And that's a picture of. This is about 1950. This is Talent Brady Hall. This is a chemistry building. And in fact, I think this was my research lab when I was at this. And you notice the hoods there uh, didn't have any drawdown. And notice no safety glasses, no lab coats, but you don't see females in there. As, as many females, and I suspect Rob would vouch for this, many of these. Wanted to go on to either Meharry or Howard you know, to, to earn some doctoral degrees. You know, Meharry's right across from this, uh, what is that, 17th Street, 18th Street? But they didn't have some aprons on. <laughs> <laughs> so, now notice, uh, I haven't began to talk about females yet, building you know, up with the males. Uh, Edward Cox, uh, Finished uh, Cornell University. He's the first African American to earn his PhD in mathematics. Uh, my friend Fred and I talk about him all the time. Evansville, Indiana, if I'm not mistaken. 
And then it's really bad, it's great, where it's clean in this room. Henry Hill was the first African American to become president of the American Chemical Society. And most of us are members. There have only been two. Uh, the second one is Joe Francisca, who is now dean of the University of Nebraska, but, um, MIT graduate, UT undergraduate, and what was he originally? Uh, Wayne State and Purdue. We tried to get him here, Joe, to check that and work out, but he's out of Nebraska. From Beaumont, Texas. Beaumont, Texas. Even high school. Uh, even a there is how we should be our Stephen High School. Uh, I'm going to talk about Henry McVeigh in a few moments, but I had the pleasure of knowing Henry McVeigh, and if you didn't get to know Henry McVeigh, you really missed a fabulous person. He was only about five feet three, but he was a little giant. But Henry McVeigh, Henry Hill, uh, Marty Taylor, and, and um, the physicist, uh, Warren Henry, I think, were all at the University of Chicago, but there were quarters there. And Henry Hill, there were three, and they said that three Negroes were enough. And Henry Hill left and went to um, MIT, finished his degree. And uh, McVeigh always told us that just like Percy Julian, he was not able to teach. He set up the lab administrations for his advisor. His advisor eventually uh, established the Journal of Organic Chemistry, uh, Karasha, that was made. And uh, so he self experience and, and we'll talk about him in his long and stellar career at Morehouse College. Um, I'm going to skip the uh, computer science person because that's, that's uh, it was more in 43 years older than I am, but Illinois. Illinois has a, a, a pretty decent record for uh, African Americans getting PhDs in sciences and in chemistry. I know quite a few of Chris Rivers and Mr. Union and Simpsons are going on the ground. Go on and on. Uh, John Smaller was the first African American to head, be the director of the National Science Foundation. Walter Massey, who was a previous president at Moon House, was the second one. Uh, we probably all heard about Marvin Dean and his work at IBM. I guess we don't use those kind of memory systems anymore. But Dr. Henry Lachey. <laughs> 1945 to 1995, that's the year he passed, uh, was the chemistry department at Morehouse for a number of years and also taught at Atlanta University. A number of students did both undergrad and master's degree. Over 70 of his students uh, went on to earn PhDs. And he know many of them grew up by chemistry organization. But he was a very interesting person, a very, very interesting person from Texas, a little town called Mahair, Texas, an undergraduate at Wiley College in Marshall, Texas, an AME school. McVeigh was a high school football star, a quarterback. But he did not get a scholarship to Wiley. He just knew that they, they uh, sent it to, to, to the wrong address. So he went to Wiley anyway, <laughs> and football players laughed at him because he was a sharp guy. And uh, he obviously did it. Make the team, and they were pretty rough. At that time, Riley was a very strong football player, a pop, I think he was a pop, pop, ball as a coach there. They were being in the schools like Curry and Southern University back, back in, in those days. I put this up, and I need to stand out here because my grandmother was a elementary teacher who started out teaching in Columbia, South Carolina, second grade. She got married, and she had to leave teaching. But she ended up teaching in rural South Carolina because they needed teachers. And this is the reason she had to leave. And this is this is Fred gave this. This is from his his uh, doctoral school, at Illinois State University. It was in the alumni magazine, and he's a rules for teachers. And if you look here, you will see things. You may not travel beyond the city limits unless you have permission of the chair of the board. That sounds like it was when I was in college. <laughs> and your dress must not be any shorter than two inches above your hand. You know, you <laughs> trip. You may not smoke cigarettes. And there's something in here. You are not to keep company with men. And, and just on and on. You must wear at least two petticoats. Now, <laughs> You know, and I will share this with someone, but my 
grandmother got married and so she had to leave teaching because they said, you get married, you're going to have children, and you're not going to come back. So it's a waste of depression. That doesn't make sense. It wouldn't work now, would it? So uh, I was a little boy and I just couldn't understand how backwards that sound. So we can see why women were not encouraged to go into careers, especially science. We had to go by the city state. Thanks for sharing that career. I appreciate it. Uh, this is a young man, this is this is more recently. He wrote this in October 2005. He's a male engineering student, and this is his letter. And he said, male engineer student perfectly explains why a female classmate on his equal. Ability, absolutely. Opportunity, no. But just inherent biases. Inherent biases. So, uh, yes, we do have males in our class and spelling, and we don't have any biases against them. <laughs> In fact, I was told the males say he's tough on the males and the females. That was the best time I ever got. Now we begin to look at females. And this is uh, 1933. Ruth L. Allen Moore, that was my grandmother's first name. First African American woman to earn a PhD in bacteriology. But we call it microbiology now. <laughs> My colleague from Ohio, Dr. Jones, is out there. From Ohio State in 1933. I can't see the second one, but Sadie Alexander earned um, a PhD in education at the University of Pennsylvania, but they should taught science. Euphrine Hayes, first African American woman to earn a PhD in mathematics at Catholic University in 1943. I think we thought it was someone else. Unfortunately, she had to spend most of her career teaching in the high school. She couldn't even get a teaching job at an African American college because there were male biases there. And I think she taught, what's the school that Luke Ellington finished in Washington, D.C.? I can't think of the name of it, but in a famous school, and um, uh, Ed Brooke, I think, finished that school in Washington. That's what she taught. Libby Hobbs Moore, first African American woman to earn a PhD in physics, 1972. And I was out of college then, and she did it at the University of Michigan. And somewhere down here I have uh, Shirley uh, Jackson, who is still, I think, president of the Princeton Union. Yeah, she was in Caltech. She was once on the board here at Strong, and she once headed the nuclear. A regulatory commission, and we have a program where our students can go and do their degree at Princeton in the controlling world. Evelyn Boyd Randville taught Eva Farquhar. I'm going to talk about her in a moment. She was the second African American to earn a PhD in mathematics. We once thought she was the first, but this other person got. With, uh, spirit of the high school. She went to Yale University and she taught Dr. Faulkner. And Dr. Faulkner made a comment as brilliant as she was, she said she was awesome. <laughs> and Dr. Faulkner was the person who majored in both mathematics and chemistry. Uh, Marjorie Brown, uh, Marjorie D. Brown, the third African American to earn a PhD in mathematics in 1950 from the University of Michigan. And you can see that is a Faulkner who our science center carries her name, and she was the 16th woman to earn a PhD in mathematics. She did it at England University. And I have down here Georgia Cockwell Smith. Uh, uh, she passed before she received her degree, but it was awarded to her in, in 1962. She was also in the math department at Smith's film. <coughs> now we get to chemistry. The first <coughs> American woman to earn a PhD was Marie Daly in 1947. Now go back 1916, St. Elmo Brady. It's a number of years, isn't it? Okay. And uh, she did it at Columbia University and um, probably in an area of food chemistry. 
I'm not sure who the second one is, but I think it was a Spelman alum, Johnny Watts. She received the honorary degree. She's a Spelman alum, and she finished at the University of Chicago. She also spent some time uh, teaching at Georgia State and, and the Conway Institute down in Tuskegee. Uh, Jesse Marks, first African American woman to earn a PhD in botany in 1935 from Iowa State University. And Roger Alina Young, we had this uh, speaker, the person who wrote Ernest Just's uh, biography, uh, Kenneth Manning. I think he, is, he did complete the book by Roger uh, Young. Uh, she earned her uh, degree in 1940 from the University of Penn, a lot of struggles. Uh, just left her at Howard when he was over in Willis Hole in, in Europe, doing a lot of his work, but also chastised her for having to leave Chicago. She started out in Chicago, did a big degree there, and went over to the University of Penn for a big degree. And uh, there were some issues, uh, some friction between she and Just, and she was dismissed. Power by Mark Carl Johnson, the male was uh, given the upper hand there. And the rest of her career was very nomadic. In fact, uh, she ended up teaching almost in every state in the Southeast <laughs> Alabama, Texas. My father was a uh, professor at Texas Southern University, and when I showed him that picture, he remembered her. Because he said, I remember her shape and her face. And that was in the early 50s, I don't remember, I think I was in nursing school. But he said <laughs> that she was only there for a year because they were holding that job for a professor who had gone off to earn his PhD. So she had to leave Texas Southern. And then, so that job was being held by, uh, by the president of the So I was not the negative at that time. Mentor this professor. But uh, she eventually had to stop teaching. She had to care for her mother. And it got to a point where she would not even complete a full semester at, 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 at uh, the schools. I think she went from Alabama to Texas and back to Louisiana and you know, Mississippi or whatever. Mary Logan Reddick, a Stone alum who spent most of her career at Atlanta University. She uh, earned her PhD at what was then Radcliffe College, part of the Harvard University, so the way you can go to Harvard, you can go at uh, Radcliffe. And she taught many of some of our former faculty members who did masters at Atlanta University. So I never met her, but I feel that I had met her with them. In fact, I felt like I met Dr. McBaby before I met him because the students talk about him all the time. So I knew his memories and his actions and everything. And uh, Lilio Alvaron, she was the first African American to earn a PhD in chemical engineering from Iowa State. Uh, Jeannie Patrick, I think who still lives here in the city, uh, earned her degree at MIT. Uh, Robert Thomas Williams, the first African American to earn a PhD in geology at from Catholic University in 1947. And I put Mae Jensen here because she was the first African American female astronaut, and she was at one time on Spelman's board. Jeremy Goodman Woods, who was chair of Howard's uh, Board of Trustees for a number of years, is another Radcliffe graduate, BS from Howard University, but she was responsible during her career at NIH for the um, MBRS program, which is, I came to MBR, it was MBS, when I was a student, MBRS and now it's the RISE school program. And so that program uh, assisted many faculty members at undergraduate institutions in getting grads to train students to go on to uh, give them training in the background of doing that uh, admissions to graduate school. This is one of my high school classmates, uh, Dr. Ella Francis Walker. Um, she was ahead of me in high school, but I was a little temperated when I was sitting in the biology laboratory and I saw these upper class students who were excited about biology. I was never excited about biology. I found a niche bunch of chemistry, and that was great. But they were just enthusiastic about science. They were touching the frogs and the snakes. I watched them and did that. 
But Ella Francis finished my high school through this week in 1961. She was the valedictorian. By the way, her father was on the football coach. And then she did a BS in physics uh, and finished that in 65. And she was second in her class at New Mexico uh, Tech. And then she did a PhD in biophysics at Stanford in 1971. She actually gave me my second teaching job when I taught in Houston. I taught at the Houston Community College, which was equivalent to our Georgia Perimeter before I left to do my doctoral degree. And she also taught at Prairie View, and she ended up uh, chairing the physics department at Texas Southern University in my alma mater uh, and before retiring. Evelyn Hammonds, a Stone alum, who is um, a professor of history and science, but Evelyn also has a BS and MS degree in engineering. She was one of the Stone's early dual degree students uh, when we saw her dual degree in the 70s, 70s, early 70s. She is a uh, native of Atlanta. She went to Southwest High School before Benjamin Mays was built. And uh, she moved on from MIT uh, to Harvard and was once a dean there, if I'm not mistaken. And she actually served on Stone's board for a number of years. And she is a writer of history. Paula T. Hammond, you probably remember her from the Nova Share meeting. She is uh, uh, a graduate of MIT, came here to Atlanta to do an MS in Georgia Tech. A lot of students do that. I know quite a few who go back. Maybe, maybe it's just too hot in Atlanta, I don't know what it is. And, and she is now a professor at MIT. I see her pretty often at some of the meetings. But I remember when Obama first became president, there was a science conference, and I remember him looking at her poster, her student's poster, because she does something, I think, in cancer research or whatever, drug delivery. I said, I know that person. And they said, Obama said, no, the, the, the scientists know. I said, you wouldn't know. And this young lady is right across the street. Uh, Nicole Green, she's an assistant professor in the Department of Physiology, but her undergraduate degree is in physics from Alabama a and She did a master's and a PhD at Alabama and Birmingham, and she looks at nanoparticle treatment of cancer. So if you Google her, uh, she's been on quite a few uh, Google's uh, Roland Models show. We are at 7 o'clock in the morning. We're doing some fabulous work. And uh, I think one of her parents died of cancer, and that stimulated her to go into that research area. So, here the figures. I haven't seen the movie, but. Uh, <laughs> I haven't seen the movie, but uh, I, I heard it's very good. It's really good. Yeah. Catherine Johnson. I don't need to tell you any more about it, but she finished the West Virginia State and spent most of her career in the Virginia uh, facility, what you would call mass back then, mathematician and computer scientist. Uh, Mary Elizabeth Jackson, I don't know the, the latest who was in the places. She's the second person. She's a Hampton Institute graduate at Hampton University now. And Dr. Vaughn, all mathematicians. You know, and computers back then, they're not as powerful as the little cell phones we get around three year olds, isn't that right? <coughs> it's really interesting. But Katherine Johnson is going to get an honorary degree from Spelman on Sunday. I heard she just got one of her this past uh, weekend. And so if you are around Sunday at uh, May 21st, she will be an honorary. But these are visible figures. Like I said, we at Spelman knew a lot of NASA. We had a nice grant, we had the NASA Wine Scholars here that Dr. Kaufman initiated, and Dr. Gray this year was one of our PIs. So our students went to NASA facilities every summer, and they had fellowships, scholarships, and every summer they, they knew they had a summer job. And uh, Christine Dodden was one of the persons, she was a researcher, but she was instrumental in, 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 in setting up these scholarships. Uh, Claudia Alexander, unfortunately she passed, she worked at the Jet Bush Laboratory. I met her through Jim King, and she was an invited speaker here. And, and a very young 
uh, person here. She's a student now, and she is interning with Born, and she's an aerospace engineering major. She's uh, involved in next. Charles Bowler, this is interesting. He was our speaker for our notion meeting in Atlanta. But Charles Bolton and I are the same age. We went to different high schools. I was in Texas, and he went to high school in Columbia, South Carolina, where I was born, C.A. Johnson High School. He was a football player, second, third string quarterback. His daddy was a coach at C.A. Johnson High School. But he was the first African American administrator for NASA. You may remember he was a shuttle, shuttle power. Shuttle power. And uh, he was a Navy. Jet fighter from the Vietnam War, or Marine, he actually was a Marine. Uh, Dr. Raymond Johnson, I'm going to mention him, he's from Alice, Texas. Went to the University of Texas as an undergraduate, did his PhD at Rice. But he has been a mentor to many students, uh, two of our students who went to Maryland for graduate school. Uh, he is now at Rice University teaching there. He was the, was once the chair of uh, the mathematics department at the University of Maryland. And uh, uh, interested in his, his history and the things that he went through as a student at the University of Texas, he had to be one of the early science students at the University of Texas. My master's uh, advisor was one of the, was the first African American to get a PhD at the University of Texas in chemistry, and several followed him. To work with Dr. Ayers, who wrote the Alabama Chemistry book. People my age would remember Dr. Ayers. Okay. But interestingly, Maryland, back in 2000, graduated three African American females with PhDs in mathematics. One of them uh, is a Spelman alum, the other is a Xavier grad, and she was once on the faculty at Spelman. I'm going to be speaking a little bit too soon. <laughs> And that's, that's Tasha Ennis. So, um, and I don't think any of them did their dissertation with Raymond Johnson. Some are similar to Isaiah Warner and LSU, who has increased the number of African Americans there, not necessarily that they're doing the work on the case. It's too much. And this is a little broader profile on, on, on the students. Kim, Kim Weems is our Spelman grad, Tosh Dennis is a Xavier grad, and Sherry Joseph is a graduate of uh, Ohio State, uh, State yes. 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 I mentioned the WISE program. These young ladies, the four of them, were WISE scholars, and all of them had faculty positions at research institutions. The one at the top, I actually taught Adrian Stitt. She was a physics major at Spelman, went on to get her PhD at the uh, University of Michigan, and she's tenured at Duke University. The second one was just a speaker here about, what, two weeks ago, Martha Cox, a uh, mathematics major, did an under, under, uh, undergraduate at Spelman and PhD at Vanderbilt. She was lured from uh, Purdue University to Ohio State, and she has a, I guess, an endowed chair, and she has an engineering education. Lakeisha Lydell, associate professor in materials at Cornell University. Uh, I think that was one of Dr. Gilliard's mentees. And she's, uh, uh, three of these persons, the first three have actually earned NSF early career awards. Um, very prestigious uh, award, I think. In the first act. And the last one, Kelly, is Charles Bolton's daughter. And I remember Monica in her talk said she was so shocked when she came to school and she was from South Georgia. And this person, Dad, is an astronaut. You know? But she went on to do very well. Kelly is a plastic surgeon. She did her medical degree at Bale College of Medicine in Houston. She grew up in Houston because her dad was. Last but not so, she grew up in the Clear Lake Johnson Space Center, and she's now a uh, professor in Howard's University School of School of Medicine. And this is just a, a, a long brief on the answer. We have a lot to thank that we have the Atlanta University Center here, our consortium. Those of you who don't know much about the center, that's the Woodruff Library. Uh, houses and volumes for, for all the schools. And 
I want to mention here the legacy of African American, legacy of African American female STEM faculty. I mean, in Barry Sullivan, Dr. Jones is out there, but Dr. Rosa Patterson is a Spelman alum who uh, have an astronaut. I think you can't see it, but she taught at a Daniel University in Spelman. She's a Spelman grad. I've mentioned the very noble grad. Dr. Lucille Tunstall, a biologist, uh, taught at Clark College and Clark Atlanta University. Dr. Gloria Anderson, who was a graduate student at Chicago when Dr. Cole, Thomas Cole was at Chicago. Uh, Billy, Billy Evans, Mohouse graduate at the University of Chicago, and I guess the core system was out there. They didn't have a female there. Uh, Andre Turner, who taught for a number of years at um, Morris Brown. I know the name because of Montisa from Columbia, South Carolina, and her, her, her great aunt was very instrumental in the civil rights movement. If you, if you Google Jessica Montif, you will see uh, her name in a lot of court cases in South Carolina. Georgia Cockwell Smith, and I made a mistake there and put Barnett, that was her husband's first name, Barnett Smith. He taught in the music department here. She's the one who received her very degree after she, she passed. Uh, Sylvia Bolson, who retired a few years back in mathematics here at Spelman. I mentioned Dr. Faulkner. Eleanor Franklin, who spent most of her career at Howard. She's a Spelman grad, but she would come to Spelman and, and teach in a short term physiology course. My colleague out there, and I hope I'm not embarrassing you, Dr. William, uh, who taught organic chemistry for a number of years and was our only organic teacher, so everyone had to go through. <laughs> and, and she is such a kind, kind lady. But I have to tell you this story. One of the students told me, you had a student that was so clumsy, she made it out to get a curse. <laughs> she was right in the plane when we had ether in the laboratory. <laughs> and she, I'm not sure it was a very kind of person. <laughs> 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 Dr. Gladys Glass, who taught mathematics here at Spelman for a number of years, who's a Spelman grad. Dr. Pamela Gunther Smith, who's a Spelman grad, and I'm sorry I have a mathematics there, I should have uh, biology there. But she is now president of York College in Pennsylvania, and prior to that, she was a VP at Pennsylvania University in uh, New Jersey. Dr. Rita Jones out there, Bobby, who's actually a Marshall Brown graduate and was my mentor when I came here when I was a little young, uh, hot, energetic, and the lip professor. They would call me down and say, you know, this is what you need to do out. And I, I really respect that. And I can tell the young black woman is here now. And Dr. Sherman Knight Bay, who was not here when I came to Spelman, but I worked with her with her QEM project. Out of Washington, but she assisted us in writing many, many grants. Most of you know Spelman, that's, that's the science name, it's named for Dr. Paul from Alpo and Manley. And our current president is Mary Campbell, and these are the number of students we have, and we still have a high number of STEM majors at Spelman. Over 100 chemistry majors, uh, nearly 300 biology majors. Uh, Double 80, a more about uh, mathematics, ages, uh, physics. So we have quite a few things to do this year. And these are just some various pictures of Dr. Falcon over the years uh, and her work at Spelman. Some of you will recognize yourselves there. Uh, and this is our science center, which was dedicated in 2002. I have to tell the story. Dr. Falcon won the triple, uh, uh, triple AAS Lifetime Mental Awards called the Lewis Hale Award. This picture I took in Berlin, Germany. I was over there with some students from the and Spelman students who were on an edu educational tour. And so you obviously see which one is Dr. Faulkner and which one is Afro. <laughs> and my students didn't know who she was. I said, this is Dr. Faulkner. I was so shocked. So I took out my cell phone and took a picture of that. And uh, well, this is at the Berlin Mathematical Institute, one of the most prestigious institutes in mathematics in the country. Lots of places in those places. But she was she was honored. So she's known across the country and across the world. Certainly was, was my mentor. And she always called it down. 
And chemistry has not always been foreign to spelling. The chemistry department didn't start until 1977. I was sent to take chemistry at Morehouse with Dr. Henry McBain. But there was a laboratory. I suspect that these were home economics students who had to do some more uh, thermodynamics or probably some calorimetry studies. But look how they dress. It's a wonder they didn't burn. <laughs> no safety glasses. But they look like pretty decent laboratory. All females. So we have, over the years, uh, got funding for programs. Spelman was recognized as a model institution for excellence program. Uh, back in 1996, we got $11 million over 11 years, and we did a lot of good things with, with that program. We were able to bring in teaching postdocs, we could give students some scholarships, they were able to do research and things that they were funded. It was an NSF program, but we, with our relationship with NASA, it was funded by NASA. We had good partners with NASA. And these are the schools that were funded. Uh, Xavier was one of the schools, uh, Spelman, Louis State. There was a, a, a group of Native American students, UT El Paso, and we always loved to travel to San Juan. And just to give, this is, this is 1995, 1999 data. Look where Spelman is in terms of the origin of BS graduates who go on to earn doctorate. We're number two. This is a 95, 99. Next to Howard, my institution, the fifth of the students. Fifth of the students. And we still hold that position. I don't know it's hard to see that one, but uh, we'll see. But we are still, this is what? Uh, well, that's 95, 99. So more recent data. Yes. We are still holding, what, number two? See, and this is 2010 14 data. Then you can identify some of the other schools, very familiar schools in the school. Now, what is happening now? The majority institutions are catching up because they are using some of the programs that we initiated. I can't fault them for that, but they've learned from us, from us in terms of mentoring students, bringing them in for some of the programs. I have a nephew starting a summer program at Georgia Tech, and it's really been a wonderful I have some colleagues, I have a colleague, Lake Winfield, who is currently chair of the chemistry department. I'm stepping down as chair. And this is a book that's edited uh, by, I can't remember the person, but it's Women Called to Lead. And there's several different written chapters in this book, so I would urge you to get it for young females. Um, here are this some legacy chemistry department chairs at HBCUs. Some are living and some are dead. Uh, I want to point out uh, Wilbur Clark at the uh, Southern University. That's where I say the morning he his undergraduate degree. He talks about Dr. Wilbur Clark and the influence he had. You see Gloria Anderson here, uh, Dr. O'Banion. I did my early work at Purdue University of Texas Southern and the Marsis. Percy Barnes at Howard, Henry McVeigh at Morehouse, I was the Elliott at Fisk University, who was a chair when I was there at uh, uh, Lord Woods, uh, Kansas State University, friends. Everyone was afraid of Dr. Woods, even the fact that he was afraid of Yes, he would kick the student out of the lab, and then he would let you back in two weeks for you were there. And I didn't know what was going on. At the end of the year, I was still on the last year on the floor. He would give you a chance to clean it. Throw it on the floor and break it up. You're paid for it. Couldn't do that now. <laughs> Dr. Spriggs, who uh, was the chair of chemistry at the uh, Clark Atlanta for a number of years, Dr. Spriggs finished my high school in Houston Lee. But the same person who taught him chemistry taught me chemistry at Houston High School. That's how I told and uh, uh, William Delaro at a and uh, Tom at North Carolina Central, a number of people. I, I had a teacher who actually did his master. You see St. Anne McGrady up there. He's uh, in the interest. Now, what you notice is you don't see many females, do you? You can look at all the years in terms of chairs. There's one, Andy King, I left off here. She was the chair at West Virginia State. 
I went there once in West but it was too cold to go back to Texas. <laughs> uh, I won't go through this list extensively, but these, these uh, other local scientists, uh, uh, Pat Gould is the Morehouse Gray, who uh, is a director of magnetic uh, imaging at NIH. Jared Wilkins, who was taught at the uh, University. Uh, Alan Turner, you should read. Very brief, free to be. So he didn't need a PhD. David Blackwell, Tony Clark at one time. And then Howard, and then was going to Berkeley and uh, was a mathematical statistician. Alice Ball, uh, Dr. Mickens has talked about Alice Ball, but Alice Ball uh, finished the uh, University of Washington. She got two degrees in pharmacy and pharmaceutical chemistry. Then she went out and did a master's at College of Hawaii, which is the University of Hawaii now. But she uh, synthesized this treatment, uh, isolated for Parkinson's disease, leprosy. Unfortunately, she didn't get the credit for it. And it, it, it was eventually called the Ball Treatment, but there was another man in the laboratory who took credit for the treatment. And only about 10 years ago that it was realized that this person actually was really good She died at was it, 26 years old. 32 years old. I may have that wrong. I think she was only 24 when she died. And they said, yeah, they said she was exposed to, exposed to chlorine, but the, the story was that she died of something else. But that was the cover up of taking her work. But she's probably working in a lab where it was invented to film chlorine gas. It had in, in isolation. But she was from Washington, Seattle, Washington. There are many references, I, I, and I will share this, but. Jesse Carter Smith was the library professor when I was there. She wrote a book, I think it's in is it second, I know it's in the second edition, but it's called Black First. And it's Black First in Science and then it's a good source book about that uh, uh, Willie Pearson, he's not here, he's a sociologist at Georgia Tech, and he looks at science. He's written several books about science and especially chemistry. Uh, I would urge you to look at some of William Pearson's references. Uh, uh, Ron Mickens, who's out in the audience, has done uh, work on, on Boucher, a lot of uh, information I got came from some of Ron Mickens. Uh, and I just highlighted those in red. You're not saying that the others are, are not necessary. And Ella Farmer, and this is a chapter we did about spelling of uh, living spirit the most work that we talk about. What is what our models for success with women in spelling? What do we do? How do we do it? Um, this is Ellen Franklin, uh, who uh, will come down to spelling every year to teach the physiology course, and she spent most of her career at how she's from South Georgia. I think um, is uh, not Dawson, but some, some small, some small town in South Carolina. She was from there. And the ocean, and, uh, these are some organizations. So, and, and, and wrapping up with this, I, when I talk to students, I always talk about my art scientists in the 20th century, and I should say the 21st century now. But in the 20th century, what did they go through? They went through struggles, failures, bias, they persevered and had mentors, teachers who cared and encouraged, and eventually they were successful. And how many of you have met Warren or know Warren in Washington? So my question is, an, uh, an African American has not won outright a Nobel Prize in science. It's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. But Warren did share, he was on a panel, and his panel was a board. It was an international panel. And, you know, they're, they're talking about the same stuff that Trump says 
doesn't exist. <laughs> but this is a reference. <laughs> he, he's out there in Boulder, Colorado, the National Atmospheric Center. He is a graduate of uh, KC. Well, Arthur was an undergraduate in KC. It was Penn State. Penn State. Penn State. And I just happened to get a nice shot of him. And he was a speaker at the History, uh, History Makers Conference in Washington, D.C. Um, who was the person where I from the past when she was the host of that particular And so, as I always tell young people, science is your heritage, past, and present, and future. So, this is, this is uh, most of the diversity. And I tell them the future's in your hands. You know, classes 2017, 18, 19, 20, and on, that will be taken. And I know I'm embarrassing somebody here, but we have some offsprings here. Not the youngest daughter, not the Nick and son. I knew them when they were kindergartners. <laughs> not the Nick and son. PhD, University of Michigan, Georgia Tech, is yeah. professor of now, yeah. computer science. And uh, I remember when we had to make him up bed. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember Anna Lisa when she was playing in the dirt in front of the nursery. <laughs> <laughs> and she ran when she saw me. You, you were a kindergarten back then. PhD now from Ohio State University. <coughs> uh, and Audrey Lawrence, who was vice chair of uh, Computer science, I told her about it. she did a PhD at MIT, and her mother was here as well. That's my daughter, that tale. She's a rising uh, senior, and she she's going to want to know what I talk about. I'm going to get that slide, so I'm going to push her. You know, what are you going to do? <laughs> I don't push her, but you know, but, you know I can get <laughs> John, I'm going to get a grid, which I'm going to get a dash. I'm going to go back. These are my parents. Now, I have two mothers. That's interesting. Now, my mother was a two mother. Her sister here is still living. She's 93 years old. Unfortunately, my mother passed when she was 71. Uh, but they were both the first in the family to get a college degree. They came from a family of 15 children with an older son. Father and mother, kids with sixth grade education. And uh, but then her father was a custodian of one of the schools in Columbus, South Carolina. Actually, they said he had more discipline than the students to impress him. This is my father. He was a uh, fourth grade teacher, along with the second grade that's called man. He's still doing more than teaching. But anyway, uh, we had to leave South Carolina. Um, I was a little kid. So my father was involved in a lawsuit. Uh, in terms of equalization of teachers' pay. Uh, back then, black teachers were making about $1,050 a year. <laughs> Make one of them a week, don't we? Sometimes. And white teachers were making about $1,700 a year. In the days when it was $30,050. He won the lawsuit, but he violated the rule and he didn't end up with this. We had to pack up and leave. Well, it made my father go on and go on the graduate school and then go to Texas. So I'd like to thank everyone who has been here. And if you're on, I'm sorry I left your name out. But, uh, the honorees, the members of the staff, the guests, the students who are bearing with me. And this is my information here. And I also have a picture of Alice Hall. <laughs> Alice Ball and her cap and gown that she finished in uh, University of Washington. So I guess this is more wrong than it is. All right, thank you very much for your
evaluation, so please evaluate um, the dinner, the presentation, and everything that helps make the event better. Thank you so much again, and congratulations to the students.